Welcome to Jumpstart Your Joy. I'm your host, Paula Jenkins. I invite you to join me as we explore how inspiring people have chosen joy in their lives and what they have to share with us about how to jumpstart joy in the world. Plus, how do we follow our own hearts, find work that lights us up while mindfully noticing the role joy plays in our own journey. Hello and welcome to episode 115. This is Paula Jenkins, the host of Jumpstart Your Joy. Happy New Year and welcome to 2018. Today, Andrea Owen of Your Kick-Ass Life joins me to talk about her second book, How to Stop Feeling Like Shit, which comes out today and I just feel so lucky to have her joining as the first episode for 2018. Andrea Owen is an author, mentor, and certified life coach who helps high-achieving women let go of perfectionism, control, and isolation, and helps them choose courage and confidence instead. She has helped thousands of women manage their inner critic to create loving connections and live their most kick-ass life. As you can tell, there will be a little bit of adult language in this episode. (laughs) Andrea and I will talk about people-pleasing, perfecting, approving, and performing, and our experience with all of that. What I love is that near the end of this interview, we talk about the myth of having to be strong as women and how it can be both a habit and a burden that is not necessarily serving us. Before we get to the interview, welcome to the show. I am so glad you are here. It's exciting to be in a new year, and I think that this interview with Andrea Owen is a great way to kick it off. I am also thrilled that later this month, I will have Emily Ann Peterson and Vitaly Beckman joining me. If you want to find out more about the show or more about me, the website is jumpstartyourjoy.com, and you can find show notes for this episode at jumpstartyourjoy.com slash episode 115. While you're over at the site, be sure and sign up for my free Joy Plus You Unleashed course, which is being revamped and reworked for 2018. You can find a link for this right on the homepage. Look for the puppy in a hat. (laughs) And I'm so excited to be reworking it and adding some new things including some Facebook Live events where we will all dig in together on how to find more joy in this new year. You'll get all the details by signing up for that course from the homepage at jumpstartyourjoy.com and then you'll be on the email list. So I am just ready to dive in with Andrea. Let's get on to the show. Today, I am so excited to have Andrea Owen on. Welcome to Jumpstart Your Joy, Andrea. Oh, Paula, I'm so happy to be here. Thank you. Yay! (laughs) Well, the first thing I ask everybody is, would you like to tell us about what you loved most as a child or in school? What were your earliest sparks of joy? When I hear that question, I'm like, oh my gosh, can we just spend the whole hour me talking about my childhood joy? Like, yes. <laughs> I, know. I love it. Like, yes. actually, no. <laughs> but if I had to narrow it down, I was so blessed. I had a really great childhood. I, I grew up an only child. My, I have half siblings, but they're much older than me. And some of them didn't live with us. So they were only there part time. So it was just me and my mom and dad. And I grew up, my parents were avid tennis players. So I grew up on the tennis courts. And I learned how to ride a bike there and do cartwheels there and like so many different things. And I think of that as being having so much joy, just seeing my parents play tennis and be happy with their friends and socialize and go to parties and, you know, get drunk. And (laughs) it was a different time. And also, I was actually thinking about this the other day. I don't know if you did this or if this was all across America or just where I grew up, but on the playground, this was back when all the playground equipment was metal. Yes. And <laughs> it was the slide. Remember the slide would like burn our thighs. But it, we had these bars and they were like bars. It was like one single bar that was probably to an adult. It was probably past, you know, chest height. And we would And there's, that's it. It's just like one single bar. And Mm -hmm. we would sit on these bars and do like backflips with like with no hands and nobody killed themselves. Like, I'm like, how did we do that? And we, and there was something called like a cherry drop. I was about to say, wasn't that a cherry drop? Yeah. Yeah. And one of them was called suicide. Like Uh that was where you flipped all the way around and like, didn't jump off. Mm -hmm. No hands. Yes. Oh, I totally remember that. I also am having me. Yeah. 
I'm having a flashback of a girl who in fourth grade, Lynn Richardson, I believe, and she broke both her arms doing suicide. Oh my god. I gosh. believe that. I believe it. Poor thing, both of them at the same time. Oh my I gosh. Know. Lots of kids like fell on their backs and got like the wind knocked out of them, but I don't remember any broken bones. But yeah, yeah. that that's what I think of when I think of, you know, elementary school playground. <laughs> yes. And four square. So much four yes. square. We played them. We did more handball when okay. it, it like against the wall. And then remember you could do a do-over, like if you didn't like your move. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Do overs are good like, in life. Like if you could just if you screwed up a presentation at work or something, and you're yep. like, I need a do over, <laughs> just start over. <laughs> yep, yep. I need a lot of do overs most days. I think. Yeah. Um. Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. I love it. Nobody's brought up the the bars yet, so I'm so glad you brought that up. I loved them as well. I'm really short, so it was hard to get up on there. But once I was there, I was really happy. You were ready for those cherry bombs, cherry drops. I, yeah, I was. Yeah. So. <laughs> Would you like to share with us what you do now for your... Yeah, I'm not a professional cherry dropper, as <laughs> you know, most people probably thought that's what I do. But no, I, I actually am a life coach and mentor for smart, high achieving women. And I, in a nutshell, I help women learn to have better coping skills than the ones that they do now. I help women who typically are... I work with a lot of women who are in a, in a corporate setting. And who have usually climbed the corporate ladder and their life looks great on the outside. They have succeeded by, you know, normal success terms and their personal relationships are struggling a lot of times and they are using numbing mechanisms that don't feel good at all. Know what it is that's holding them back and they're ready to change and they're ready to move into a different direction. Mm, Yes. Ooh, that's all good stuff. Because it feels like, yeah, for so long, we strive and we achieve. And then we hit either a place that we're like, yeah, this is where I wanted to be. And then we're looking around and saying, what else happened right here? What happened? Yeah. How did I get here? And they, yeah, they get to a certain point in their life where they're just, they know that something is missing. And they also, the women that I work with are well-versed in personal development. They've read a lot of personal development books. They've probably gone through therapy and like know what their family of origin stuff is. And they've worked a lot on that, but they're ready to move forward from that. Mm, yeah. Yeah, that's interesting because there is a certain amount that goes into kind of starting to know your stuff, but then mm-hmm. the action. And I love that, oh, your book, your new book is so all about the action yes. as well. I love the action side of it because it's so easy to get into the heady space of, okay, this is all the things that are going on, but then how do I pull that into my my life for right now? Um, mm-hmm. Exactly. Strong. Yeah. Well, and if I may, I mean, like jumping way ahead in the book and and I really kind of struggled, like, should I make this the first chapter of the book or the last chapter of the book? And we decided to make it the last. And it's all about, it's a whole chapter on values. And values is kind of that thing that I I kind of half joke that it's like kind of unsexy, you know, like values, like, isn't this something we do in like team building training stuff? And it really is though, it's foundational in your personal development journey because all of this doesn't matter all of the conceptual heady stuff doesn't matter if you don't know like your values or your, or your map, your compass, your North star. It doesn't matter if you don't know what exactly is important about the way that you live your life. What's important about how you show up and not just naming what your values are. Cause it's really easy to go like, Oh yeah, I have a value around integrity or courage or spirituality. I want to know like the meat of that is what does that actually look like on a day-to-day basis? When someone on your team at work completely drops the ball and is being a complete flake and you have to have a hard conversation, where is that value around courage and integrity? Like, what is that going to look like? Because that's going to, that's going to mean you're going to have a hard conversation and nobody likes confrontation (laughs) and you're probably going to avoid it. So that's the stuff, like the everyday stuff that we encounter. What are you going to do? What is it going to look like? What do you need to know and practice? Mm Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah. And it is so foundational, like you're saying, to know your values and know them in a deeper way. Cause I've also been through coach training. Mm-hmm. And I agree. Like when we when they first said, Oh, let's talk about values, that everybody did kind of go, Oh, uh, really? <laughs> like <laughs> didn't we do this at rock climbing, you know? Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> like, like, boring. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but I think it's it's so interesting because then it also has that crossover. It gets a little Danielle Laporte, but like the values and also how do you want to feel? Like those two things were completely game changing to me 
and I work in a, a corporate setting nine to five most of the time. So, but yeah, knowing, okay, how do I want to be in this moment and who do I want to be and how do I want to show up? The values are key to that. Otherwise you're kind of lost. Exactly. And I, I don't think that we ever really think about this a whole lot. I know I didn't before coach training. And even to be honest, when I was in coach training, I kind of half-assed it, you know, like, okay, I'll just name my values. Yeah. And God bless the first girl that ever coached me. Like we didn't go any further than that. But I, I've now learned over the last decade that like the actual work, you know, naming them is only, it's kind of like naming a baby. And that's what I say in the book. Like that's just... Mm-hmm. You can't call that parenting. Like <laughs> just choosing a name for your child is not parenting. It's just naming it. The real parenting happens, you know, every day over and over and over again. Same with values. Well, and I just, I love your book, which is coming out today when this goes live, January 2nd. And it's how to stop feeling like shit. And I just loved it. <laughs> I never get tired of hearing the title. I'll be honest. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I, I probably sounded a little sheepish because I'm like, ooh, we get to swear. <laughs> yes. um, but yeah, I love that you're kind of approaching this whole work from here's what's happening, like we just said. And then, but the, here's how to fix it. Because mm-hmm. I don't know if I've seen that combo in many books before. I mean, I think Emily Wapnick does it pretty nicely with how to be everything, but that's all about multi-passionate stuff. So not totally applicable here, but the, the digging in deep around personal growth and development, I think that's the hardest part is crossing that line between here's the thing. Okay. I get, I'm doing it, but then what do I do to make it better? Yeah, Um, exactly. Yeah. Do you want to explain a little bit about the book and maybe how you came up with the idea? How did it come to be? Yes. Cause it's, it's definitely got a story of how, Mm -hmm. uh, how it was born. And what happened was a couple of things were key players in making this project be what it is today. And one of them is that I went and was certified. I went to San Antonio, Texas and was certified in the work of Dr. Brene Brown with her her senior faculty. This was in the summer of 2014. And for those people listening that don't know who she is, she is a researcher and author who's dedicated her research to studying shame and courage and authenticity and connection. She's a very famous TED Talk that came out in 2010, which really sparked her career. I started following her even before that. And her work has always resonated with me. And when I became certified in her work, she talks about the armor. And she says that it's these behaviors that we do that we think are protecting us from criticism, failure, shame and really they're not they're keeping us small and so you know it's just like one of the many things that that she talks about and what I found is that that was predominantly a struggle for the women that I work with and Brene talks about a handful of them but I kept going with it and I'm like well it's also it's those and all of these behaviors it's control and overachieving and self-sabotage and imposter complex and and all of these behaviors and habits that we have gotten to know so well that they just become a part of their lives. I I joke that it's like, it's become our to-do list. You know, I'm going to wake up in the morning and I'm going to, you know, inner critic away, my negative self-talk, and then I'm going to go overachieve at work. And then I'm going to go home and numb out and isolate. And it's like, it's just what we do. It's how we cope with life. And so what I also started paying attention to my clients and the women in my groups and asking them questions. I did a survey in 2015 where I was asking women like, do you struggle with these two? And overwhelmingly, they were raising their hands and saying, yes, I do all of those behaviors. Mm -hmm. So that's really when I started doing my research. And I had already written one book and my my literary agent had asked me, you know, like, when are you going to write that second book? I said, never, because (laughs) it is really like having a child. Like you have a newborn and you're like, never again. Authors often say books find us. We don't find them. And this one came whispering. And I knew very quickly that I needed to write about these specific behaviors that women do. And I did research and got stories. And it just became so painfully obvious that this was a struggle for all women. I have yet to meet a woman who looks through those 14 behaviors and goes, no, I don't struggle actually with any of those. I never have. And that's what I want to say. One last thing about it is that I want to normalize these behaviors. This isn't a book where I'm saying, here are all the things you're doing wrong. You need to change them ASAP and don't do them anymore. This is a book about here are the things that we all do regularly. Let's have massive self-awareness around it so that when they do come up in our life, 
we can get out in front of it quickly and choose behaviors that actually feel better to us and are more in alignment with the women that we want to be. I mean, I think it's interesting. There's a piece of shame there, right? Mm -hmm. I feel like it's shameful to admit that, oh my goodness, I'm a people pleaser, or at least there's that stigma around it. Or hi, I'm an overachiever. It feels like those are not things you yet say out loud in a room full of people and then people want to talk about it. Yes. And I think that sometimes we wear them as a badge of honor, you know, like one of the behaviors is the whole concept of being strong. And I've had people say that they're perfectionists and they, again, like wear it as an attribute, you know, as a positive attribute. And these things are killing us. Like, I know I'm being dramatic, but like, and I also say a few times in the book that there's a saying in, in recovery in 12 step programs that says it works until it doesn't. Mm -hmm. And that is the case with pretty much all of these behaviors for achieving served me. It's what allowed me to graduate with honors from college. What allowed me to be a go-getter for some people, they might say my inner critic has been my motivator. And again, like they might work for a while until you get to a point where it is painful and, you know, perfectionism is just bringing you down and control is starting to eat away at your personal relationships. And same thing with overachieving and et cetera. It works until it doesn't. And this book is for people who are at that point where they're like, I am ready to choose another way. Have you seen, is there, um, I don't know, a universal kind of moment or thing that seems to hit people that moment when it doesn't work anymore? Great question. I don't necessarily think so. I mean, even for me, I had a rock bottom moment about 11 or so years ago. And it wasn't, you know, I didn't like wake up that day and say like, oh, these are the things that I'm doing that are making me feel terrible. It was that whole aspect of paying attention. So the people that seem to gather around me are people who, again, are versed in in personal development. They know they want to live a better life. And sometimes they need help being pointed in the direction of what is actually going on that they can solve. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, totally. Yeah. And I think it's interesting. I mean, probably rock bottom feels a lot the same to every... I mean, for different reasons, there's something about it that probably feels similar to most people, they know when they're there, but then how do they get out of it? I I just want to say too, that you don't have to have a complete rock bottom in order to change your life. I think it makes for really great and entertaining stories for memoirs, but I don't necessarily (laughs) think that everyone who changes their life has that like pivotal moment where, you know, it's it's a lifetime movie. I I think that it can be a series of things where you just are tired of having poor boundaries or you're tired of worrying so much what other people think. I think it can be, you know, a combination of of several of those types of things to where you make a decision to change your life. And boundaries are so key. I remember a while back, a friend just said to me something, I I was miserable. And he said something like, yeah, you've got to watch your boundaries. And I was like, what's that? What is that? (laughs) (laughs) Which is probably so telling. How do we go about it? Because that's a tender area for a lot of people is that because I think that's one of those things that comes up, I think, as you say, in the people, people pleasing and Mm -hmm. some of those other habits that maybe aren't serving us well, but it's really hard to say, here's my boundary. I don't want to go past it. How do we start yeah. with that if we're there? I really love talking about boundaries because I do think that there is a step-by-step process. So to quickly, I had that same moment when I was at... My life had totally fallen apart and I was in college at the time and I was at the counselor's office and mm. she said to me... I don't remember exactly how she said it, but she said something to the effect of like, what you really need is self-love. And I was like, what? <laughs> what is that? Mm. And I think that self-love is like this big topic that is encompasses so many different things about self-trust and self-acceptance. And I mean, we could have a whole nother talk about that. But in terms of boundaries, it really is one of those things where, and I go through it in the book, like here's how you do it. And the tricky thing about boundaries, though, I will say is that it's not just about having the conversation and being clear about it and, and setting the boundary. It's about following through because more than likely, that person that you're setting the boundary with is going to test you and do the thing again that you're asking them not to do. And that's where your values come in, right? Because if you have a value around courage and authenticity and integrity, well, you're <laughs> you're being called to show up in that moment. So I think boundaries, although they are, they can be hard, some hard lessons, 
but I do think that they're something that absolutely can be learned. And it's just having the courage to have the hard conversation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And I love that you offered the example, I think of a, of a difficult boss or kind of going to them when they've given you too much work and like, how do you set that boundary? Yeah. It's, it was helpful to have an example of it because I think everyone can relate to that person. Mm -hmm. They might just be used to you doing the thing that you've always done. So it's a shock to them when you're like, I'm not doing this anymore. (laughs) Yeah, well, I think boundaries kind of get a bad, a bad reputation. You know, people oh, sure. think yeah. that they are something that needs to be confrontational or, you know, only bitches set boundaries. <laughs> and those are myths. Like, that's actually not true. So there's a difference between having a hard conversation and, and maybe making a request versus setting a boundary. And so boundaries tend to be very black or white. Like, if you keep doing this, then this is the consequence. And a hard conversation might just be that you're making a request. So neither of those are easy. <laughs> mm-hmm. But I just, I think my, the point is, is that I don't want people to think that, because I used to think that boundaries were, you know, you needed to get all, you know, feathers all ruffled and, and get ready for a showdown. And it doesn't have to be that way. And they're better received when they are dealt with kindness and honesty. Mm, yeah. Yeah, that's so true. And it gets easier as you go. <laughs> After you have those first awkward conversations about, I'm going to set my boundary. Yeah. Then the next ones seem to be easier. One of the other things I just loved about this book is that you talk about joy in it. And I have to say, it was when you were explaining about catastrophes, kind of like why people are holding them back, holding themselves back from going just full tilt joy. And I had never... I'm probably just, you know, one of those very natural outgoing people that just doesn't stop. So I had never really thought about it. Would you explain kind of what you have to say about why people kind of hold themselves back from joy? Yeah. And, you know, to give her credit, this comes from Brene Brown's research. And she talks about how one of the hardest emotions for people to feel is joy because it requires us to be vulnerable. And the way I talk about it is what I have seen in my clients and through my own research is a couple of different things. The women that I talk to who really struggle with this feel, you know, it's like they know what disappointment feels like and rejection and, you know, having expectations, et cetera. Like we know what sadness is and, and all of that. So for us to lean into joy is risky. Because our brains are like, oh, remember when this didn't work out last time? Or, you know what I mean? So we know that when we have an emotional attachment to something, that it can hurt if it doesn't work out. It's not a guarantee that it's not going to work out. But our brains are so interesting in in so many different ways. One of those ways is that we haven't evolved that much from many, many, many (laughs) millennia ago and how our brains are really just trying to protect us from danger and death. And I think that that plays a part in it as well. But I also think it comes down to women have a hard time even doing things like accepting and acknowledging and being proud of their accomplishments and praise. We have such a hard time accepting praise for what it is, you know, someone extending love and gratitude towards us. So um, I might've gone off on a little tangent there, but, <laughs> but joy, I feel like joy. And I tell me if, if you agree with this or not, like I feel that joy and happiness are, they're like sisters, but they're not twins. They're not the same. To me, happiness is like in your head, you know, it's like, yay, yay. joy is like a full body experience. <laughs> it is in yes. your bones. And many of us like reserve it for, or when you ask someone like, tell me about a joyful moment, they reserve it for really big moments in their life. You know, the birth of children, getting a promotion, marrying the love of their life, et cetera, et cetera. But, but you can, and we have the ability to feel joy in these everyday moments. Mm-hmm. And that personally has been something that is, I don't say this, a lot unless I really mean it, but it has changed my life because it is, you know, we live in a world that doesn't really encourage us to, you know, the whole like be present, you know, <laughs> and and just these small moments of like seeing my children laugh and like sitting with them at the dining room table and and having them share their excitement with me and and stopping and shutting the rest of the world out for five seconds to revel in that moment is leaning into joy. And our brains tell us that that is risky but it, it's practicing that and moving through it 
can be life changing. Yeah, there's a lot in that, right? Like, and I agree that happiness, it's interesting because there was a man who's a spiritual medium that came on and (laughs) he tapped into the spirits and they said that happiness is contentment and that joy is actually what we should aspire to. And I'd never really thought about that differentiation Uh in a specific way, but it was kind of a beautiful differentiator, but that like, yeah, happiness can be day to day and we can realize we're, we have that contentment or that comfort level. But I love what you've said. I think it's those things where you can drop in and be so present in a moment and realize, oh my goodness, look at all. And you could use your own words, like look at all the goodness, look at all the blessings in this second. It's interesting too, that you brought up children. Cause I often have that, that split second moment with my son of just like, oh my gosh, <laughs> there's so much joy right here. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know if that's a universal, but it's very interesting. I think something changes when we have kids. Yeah. And it's really interesting too, how like in that next moment, we can imagine something horrible happening to them or, Mm. you know, we, we see something on TV that's happened to someone else. And I I think part of it is just our ability to have empathy for other people, but Mm. it can kind of go awry very quickly and um, it doesn't ever feel good. And it's, and it's, it's a lesson to learn to actually, of course you can still feel empathy and you can feel someone else's pain, but it doesn't mean that it is going to be your pain. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And there's also that very interesting thing that happens is when you are, you can still hold two emotions in the same space too. You can realize there's pain, but you can also recognize that there's joy in this very moment. And that Mm -hmm. doesn't, those two don't take away from each other. Yeah, Yeah. exactly. (laughs) It's a strange space to be for sure. Yeah. I don't know. How have you seen people really embracing joy and giving themselves permission to feel that in that space. Well, I mean, speaking of children, like children are amazing at this, aren't they? Especially mm-hmm. toddlers. <laughs> um, yes. Their range of emotions is like nothing anyone can contend with. And I never knew this until I had my own children. I didn't grow up around other small children very often. And so I just would watch my kids just be engrossed in one thing. I mean, they have the ability to be present. Also, like we should aspire to be as as grownups. But I think that it's also watching people who have circumstances that you would think would bring them down and just really take them down and they still choose to experience joy. I mean, not in every single moment, but Mm -hmm. they still choose to experience it. I wrote about it in the book. I have a friend, Michelle, and she, at the time that I asked her about joy, she was going through chemotherapy for breast cancer for the second time. And she had a young daughter at the time. Her, her daughter was really little, I think. And and she still was choosing joy. And it was just as we described, you know, it's like she would choose moments to look around at her family or her friends or whatever she was choosing and, and experience joy. And I think that I don't want people listening to think that that you and I are saying like, oh, it's so easy. You just choose. You just make the decision. Because I, no. I think it's compli- more complicated than that for some people. Mm-hmm. And, but, but I do think that it's worth giving it a shot. I mean, again, like I said, five seconds, just try for five seconds and watch what happens. Like pay attention to what comes up, pay attention to that quiver of fear that you might feel. It's completely normal, but it starts with practicing it, making the decision to practice it. Mm-hmm. Yes, yes. And I, and I think I know this, the Michelle that you're speaking of, and she does make a mindful choice, I think, to be mm-hmm. in the moment and to recognize the goodness of the moment. Absolutely. And maybe that's just kind of the first step up for people is, is being able to see the goodness and accept yeah. that and see that there is a positive thing in this very moment. See the goodness. Yes, I love that. Mm, yes. We've also talked a little bit about people pleasing, approval seeking, and you talk about perfectionism separately as one of these habits Mm -hmm. in the book as well. I feel like there's something that's kind of intimately tied about all of these things that kind of dance around the idea of joy. And I think it goes something like this, that it feels like those three things are often very much ways maybe people are trying to find joy or bring happiness to other people. But they're not, I mean, it seems like it's, it's just kind of maybe a misguided attempt. I don't know if you have anything that you've seen with kind of the people pleasing, approval seeking or perfectionism. I don't know, that kind of could shed light on trifecta. (laughs) What are people doing there? (laughs) 
Well, I think that it's all effort. I think if you go a few layers deep, I think it's all in an effort to engineer the way they are perceived by others. Because deep mm-hmm. down, and and you know, myself included, I've I've really struggled with I, I say like, you know, pleasing, perfecting, proving, and performing. And it is because we are so invested, because we don't feel, we don't have that core knowledge that we are enough that we don't need the approval of others. Like, like, well, let's, like, let's be honest, like getting the approval of others is pretty awesome, right? Like, mm-hmm. I, I, I'm not saying that it's don't ever do it. I think that it is a lifelong journey to get to a place where you are secure enough in yourself and trust yourself enough to know that you are good enough no matter what. I also want to say one more thing about that. I think that that is a a cycle that we go through. I have talked to so many women and so many experts on this topic that I have yet to meet anyone who has done a ton of work on themselves and feels 100% worthy all of the time. Mm -hmm. I think that everyone drops into those moments of feeling not good enough. and it's a lifelong thing. And I, I kind of went off on a side tangent there. So let me pull it back in. <laughs> in regards to people pleasing approval seeking and perfectionism, again, I think the bottom line of it is what I'm trying to say is, is that, that when we do that, we are there's a part of us that's feeling not good enough. And we are also trying to avoid shame. And and people kind of, you know, tilt their head sideways a little bit when I when I say that. And it's because it's not that people that most people walk around feeling ashamed all the time. I think some people do, some people it's their baseline. But I think for the majority of the people that I speak to and that are in my audience, they are constantly running away from it. They know what shame feels like. And many times, many, many, many times, this is not a conscious thought. This is an unconscious thing that is running the show. They know what shame feels like and they are desperately trying to avoid it. Again, they're trying to avoid criticism. They're trying to avoid judgment and trying to avoid failure. And so they engage in perfectionism, people pleasing and approval seeking. Mm, Yes. Yeah. And would you explain in case someone is not familiar with kind of your definition of shame and how it can often run the show? Would you explain that for us? It's that the way I describe it, it's, it's that feeling that I am not good enough, and I'm different from the others. Nobody will accept me. And feeling like an outsider. And I give a couple of examples in the book from middle school. But it's just, I think we've all been in those those situations where, you know, for one of the examples that I gave in the book was when I was in seventh grade, I had a math teacher who would, we had weekly quizzes and they were graded. And he would hand out the, the graded quizzes um, every week. And if you got a D or an F, he would put an extra, like a half sheet of paper and it was stapled and you had to take it home and have your parents sign it. And he called it a tag. And everybody knew that he handed out the tagged papers at the very end. So at the top of the stack were everybody that got A's, B's and C's. And at the bottom of the stack was anybody that got a D or an F. So it was like, I mean, looking back on it, I'm like, oh my God. Like, <laughs> so yeah. mean, Mr. Bosworth. And I happened to me, I mean, this was right on the trouble time I started to struggle with math and And luckily, I was lucky enough that my parents were able to get me a tutor. And but those were some hard. That was shame, you know, being handed that test and and feeling small examples. These are this is not like these huge things that happen to me. But this is what makes a difference in our life. You know, it's these small moments of feeling ashamed about ourselves that stick with us and create these core beliefs that end up pushing us towards things like perfectionism, like overachieving. Like, and, and that this is where it comes from is these small things. I mean, probably everybody listening has a story or two or 10 from middle school alone of shame, of being either shamed on purpose by someone else or being shamed by your parents. Because let's be honest, as a disciplinary tool, I'm using like air quotes, it works. It, you can change someone's behavior with shame on a dime, but it has detrimental long-term effects. Everybody has experienced these and can tell stories of it. And many of you will say like, but it was so long ago and I'm over it. Like that very well may be the case, but those experiences have led you to the behaviors that you are doing today. And that's what the, where the book comes in. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Ooh, and I can relate to the math, the math shame. I got put oh, in a algebra. cubicle with a timer, <laughs> a kitchen timer. It was very, very scarring. So stressful. It is. Well, because you already, I mean, as a person, you already know this is hard for me. 
But then when you're labeled as separate, and, and maybe yeah. that's kind of the universal thing about shame is then you're labeled as separate and it feels even worse. So you're yeah. different. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And like, and it's, and it's really, again, like going back to brain science, this is a biological thing that happens to our brains because way back in the, you know, the caveman days, I know that's not the, uh, the, the right term for it, but bear with me. I'm, I'm not a historian that that meant death. If you were different mm. than the others, yeah. If you couldn't quote unquote keep up and be like everybody else, then you probably died. If you got pushed out of the community, out of this group or, or tribe, it meant death. And our brains still think that. Our brains still like the old part of our brain. It's not a conscious thing. We don't think like, oh my God, I'm dying, clutching our chest. But it's it's this thing that happens to us physiologically. So it's it's I always like to normalize it. Like you're normal that this is happening. The awareness is what brings you change and makes you feel better. Mm, yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it's so hard as a younger person, probably those middle school experiences can be so, I don't know, formative because our brains, you know, you can't be self-aware enough in middle school most of the time to know what's Mm -hmm. happening. It's just all, yeah, it's kind of that biological response and it's so scary. Yeah. I know you mentioned that you had a personal crisis uh, partway through writing this book. How did that impact the book itself? Yeah. So what happened was my dad, I never, okay. I'd never lost anyone in my life. Mm-hmm. And I kind of knew it was coming. You know, my parents are getting a little bit older and I was about, I don't know, 60 or so percent of the way done writing this book. And my dad got sick at the end of September of 2016 and he died on October 16th. So it was very fast. And I was with him when he died. I, I flew back home I, from San Diego and I flew back to be with him. And, and it was devastating to say the least. And I had to, it was interesting because here I am writing this book on coping skills and and behaviors that we do, especially behaviors that we do when life gets really hard. And it was sort of ironic, like, am I going to eat my words? And I I wrote about it in the third chapter around numbing because one of my coping mechanisms of, of choice has always been numbing. Like I didn't, I didn't have, for a long time, I did not have the tools and, and skills to feel my feelings. Any, especially the really hard ones, I pushed that under the rug. I did not like if we just be really quiet about it, maybe it'll go away, you know. And and that was really the mentality that I grew up with and that I adopted. <laughs> very, you know, very voraciously adopted that concept of not wanting to feel my feelings. And so when I got home, I had to sit down and finish writing this book and really had to look, take a good hard look at at these behaviors. And it and it really just reiterated the message that I had about normalizing them. So yes, I did have a few days where I completely shut everybody out and didn't want to talk to anybody and then isolated and, and hid. And there were times where I, I numbed out and I went to the mall and spent entirely too much money on an outfit to wear for my dad's funeral. And, and I felt better for about 10 minutes and, and these things that, that we do. And I was aware of them and I was nice to myself along the way. I think that that's the most important part is that I didn't beat myself up for any of it. And yes, I had to make some apologies to people that I had lashed out at because in my own grief, but I'm grateful for the lessons. And it was, it was really interesting to watch, you know, to like kind of take a step back and watch it all unfold. Yes. Mm, Thank you for sharing about that. Um, I'm so sorry for your loss. Thank you. Yeah. It is interesting what to see things unfold, especially in the midst of being in the process of writing about it. Mm-hmm. I don't know. Did it change? You said it, it did impact how you were um, you were wanting to normalize some of the behaviors or like normalize the conversation around the behaviors. Was there anything else that came out of out of it? I think, too, that I, I really got to know how I work in a crisis. I had always kind of known that I was good in a crisis, but I had never been in that kind of crisis. And if anyone's familiar with family systems and, and that, you know, there's people who overfunction and there's people who underfunction. And typically in a crisis like that, we do one or the other. I'm definitely an overfunctioner. So my stepmother made the comment, she turned to me one day I was driving and I think it was when my dad was, I think he had just died a couple of days prior. And, and she was talking and she turned to me and she said, you're doing surprisingly well. And I said, I'm really good in, you know, <laughs> under this much stress. 
And when I get home is when it's all going to fall apart. <laughs> you know, and I was the one who was organizing most of his servant and doing all these things. And, um, but I was really aware of it. I, I knew like when I needed to relinquish responsibility and surrender. And, and really, you know, two months after he died, I got the word surrender tattooed on, on the inside of my arm because mm-hmm. I've always struggled. Out of all of those 14 habits that I wrote about, control is the hardest one for me. I want an itinerary. I want a guaranteed outcome. <laughs> Even if it's a negative one, I just want you to tell me what's going to happen. I don't like not knowing what's going to happen. And it's the uncertainty. And it's that whole concept of, of self-trust again, right? And that kind of grief, you have to surrender. It is like childbirth. If anyone listening has ever birthed a child or, or even if anyone out there has ever projectile vomited, you know, it's like you, you cannot hold that in, right? <laughs> like your body is going to do whatever it needs to do to take care of itself. Grief is the same thing. And grief is one of those things that it's, it's so incredibly painful that And we are, I think as a culture, we are so uncomfortable with it, feeling our own grief and other people's grief. I know for many years, I didn't want to touch that with a 10 foot pole, somebody else's grief or my own. I could not bear my own feelings. So I sure as hell could not be with yours. And that element of surrender and trusting myself enough that I could walk through this fire and not only be okay for having walked through it, but be an even better human and having that rich life experience for having walked through that fire. That kind of trust was something that I did not have before this. And it, it took really took the experience of having it. So when I say those were some big lessons, that what I just said were some of those lessons. Mm, yeah. Yeah. Thank you for sharing them. Yeah. In my experience, grief is, I mean, just like you said, there's no other way but through it. And right. And it is that surrender and also being a total a type A personality and really wanting to know what's next. Yeah, that was one of the biggest, one of the biggest learnings from my own, the birth of my son, which was, Mm -hmm. which went very different than anyone would have been able to plan. So it was one of those very hard, like, okay, well, we're just going to make this happen. (laughs) Here we go. Here's the leap. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Yes. (laughs) So thank you. Very, so very well stated about all of that. Do you have anything else to add about the the book or some of the habits that stood out to you as you were writing? I think the one that I love to talk about the most, well, I love them all, but I think mm-hmm. that the one that doesn't get talked about a whole, whole lot is the concept of being strong. I reserved a whole chapter for this because the women in my community, we grow up having a whole badge of, of being strong. Like we wear that with honor. And we get praised for, quote unquote, being strong. We tell each other to be strong. And it was that chapter was born from actually a Facebook post that I saw. This woman wasn't my friend, but it, it must have been a friend of a friend or, that shared something. I, I can't remember specifically, but it was a woman who had been in a car accident. She was driving and she was with two or three of her children. And one of her children died. Mm. And there were so many comments that said, stay strong, mama be strong. Your kids need you to be strong. And I was like, the woman just lost her baby. Like she has every right to fall apart at the seams. I know I would. And I think that of course, all those people meant well. And I think that we, again, it was, goes back to what I was just saying. We are so uncomfortable with, with pain Mm-hmm. And we have, we, I think so many people, myself included for many years before I got sober in 2011 are just like emotionally illiterate and afraid of hard feelings. And I, I write about in the book, like I want to change the definition of being strong because to me, being strong is actually reaching out for help when we need it is falling apart when we need to fall apart is walking into grief as grief comes to the door and calls us like these real life things that end up happening to everyone in a lifetime. That to me is being strong is to be able to sit with someone in their pain when you are uncomfortable and when you don't know what to say, when you want to fix it, when the urge is to fix it, but you know, there are no words that can actually take this pain away from that person. That is being strong. That's hard to do, to sit there with someone like that. Mm -hmm. And like, 
I just, I feel like I get really fired up about this, Paula, obviously. Mm. <laughs> but well, I just it totally wanna, resonated with me. Like I want to turn the definition yeah. on its head of what yeah. being strong really is. Because you know what? For the longest time, I thought being strong was to just suck it up and soldier on. Sweep it under the rug. We don't have to talk about it. No, nope, it's fine. It's fine. It's all fine. I'm going to be okay. Let's talk about you instead. That's not being strong. That's being afraid. Mm -hmm. Yes. And I think the thing that stood out for me too, when you talked about it in the book was an example of, of a group of friends of mine. And we were talking, we were all strong ones. I'm using air quotes over here. Mm -hmm. And talking about how people then, if something, if there, a crisis comes up in your life, how people also seem to, they don't check in in the same way when you're one of the strong ones that, oh, you're strong, you're going to be fine. You know, there's almost like this thing where then the expectation from those people around you are that you don't need the same kind of help as someone else who may be showing vulnerability in most situations. And right. it was just, it's a very interesting place to be because really the conversation there was around I don't know why, and I think this person was saying their family, but I, I'm not saying that necessarily. It could be your friends or your family, but I don't know why people aren't checking in with me. This is as hard for me as it is for, I think this was a, the person's sister, but it's just because I'm always so, I'm seen as so strong. And that was just, the grief in seeing that in that person was like, oh my gosh, I feel your grief. There's empathy for this. And you're right. This isn't okay. There's something wrong about this definition of strong or yeah. not healthy about this definition of strong. So yeah, I'm fired up too. <laughs> yeah, well, I, and I think, yeah, <laughs> I think too, you know, we teach people how to treat us. And I think mm. that for many of us, because I can speak from personal experience as having always been the strong one. And the way I made that impression for the people around me was because I never showed them truly how I was feeling. Mm. And so of course they wouldn't, and even if they did check in with me, I would have lied and said, you know, I was so good at lying about it. I convinced myself that I was okay and told them like, it's totally fine. I remember like, since all of this truth has come out about how I was feeling like in my twenties, my best friend that I, I still talk to her sometimes we live on opposite coasts, so we don't spend as much time together. But this woman was my best friend from the time I was 14 or 15 until the time I was around 31, 32. We were talking and she was like a profusely apologizing. And she's like, Andrea, I had no idea that you were feeling that way. I'm so sorry. I wasn't a better friend. And I was like, Shelby, I didn't know. Like, and, and I was lying to myself that I was okay. Like that was my job to be, I had made it my job to be this strong pillar of strength for everyone. You know, I had, I've been through some hard times in between the, the ages of 17 and 19 and my friends knew about them. And I just, I didn't ever lead on that things were really sucking because that to me was complete weakness. That was not who I was. And mm -hmm. I come from a legacy of strong women. And again, I'm using air quotes. <laughs> and now I'm seeing that, you know what that was? It's, that was a legacy of pain allowed to be talked about that was just generation after generation of not having the words to put around it of what was really happening. And that I know from personal experience can simmer over into full on rage. That was it. That's how it manifested for me. And I would have these rages and like, didn't know where they were coming from. It's like, oh my God, like <laughs> now I know. And so I think for many, and I say all this because I wonder how many people out there are listening and going, me too. I also have been creating this facade that I have it all together and that I'm fine, but I'm really not fine. Mm, yes. Yeah, so powerful. Cause I do see that in my own family and that, you know, well, you just have to be strong. It's kind of, <laughs> it's the Protestant, oh. pull yourself up by your bootstraps, whatever yes. that, whatever that nonsense What does that is. mean? What are bootstraps anywhere? Are they like suspenders for your boots? <laughs> I don't even know. <laughs> yeah, we came across, in the, across the parent prairie and it's the scooter and yeah, you got to do whatever, like all that. It Boy, it's deep, isn't it? Yeah. It yeah. Mm, so yes. Well, this has been so amazing. And I just, I really do. I read the thing, the whole book and just couldn't stop and couldn't put it down. So it's well, how you. to stop feeling. Oh, yes. Well, I'm so glad it's out there. And I encourage all the listeners how to stop feeling like shit. And I will have a link in the show notes. But where else can people find out more about you before we get into our last two questions? So yes, the book is, you can order it on Amazon or it's at, in bookstores. January 2nd. And it's actually on the front tables of Barnes and Noble for the first few weeks of January. So that's really exciting. And I'm also offering a free 
book club, like a book study club online for anyone that has a copy of the book, whether you get it on audiobook or, you know, e-reader or whatever. And what I don't want is for people to buy the book and then just like consume the information and be like, that's nice. Cause I, or just like buy it and not read it. I mean, I've done that like a hundred times. <laughs> so I wanted to give people support and guide them personally through the book. And we'll talk, we're talking about all the behaviors in order and they can find that. I'm sure I'll give you the link in the show notes, but it's yourkickasslife.com slash H-T-S-F-L-S. That's the acronym for the book, How to Stop Feeling Like Shit. Awesome. Yes, I will link it up. Is there anything you're offering in 2018 this year that you are excited about and want to share? Offering a couple of things. I think the thing I'm most excited about is coming in the spring. I'm offering a group program called Raise Hell. And it is the first, it's going to be its pilot round. And I know the name is kind of like, what? And we're like, you know, like, no, we're not going to be writing. It's really, it's a group program for women who are ready to really take their values to the next level. And I believe that for a woman to dig her heels in and draw a line in the sand and really just know what makes her proud of who she is and know what makes her her best self I think that is an act of raising hell because we typically are not rolled out the red carpet <laughs> when we're ready to really step up and step forward. So that's what this is going to be about. That sounds so awesome. Because <laughs> you're right. It's hard to find the community for that. And it's also hard to celebrate like, okay, I'm ready to kick ass now. Let's do this. Yeah. And I think I think kicking ass too isn't always about winning. It's not always about getting it right every time and like mm-hmm. having the last word and things like that. Like all those things feel really good. But really kicking ass to me is about leaning in hard to your values and like having those hard conversations, even though you don't know if that conversation is going to turn in your favor. It's about asking for that raise, even though there's a risk that you're going to get turned down. It's about going out and dating again when you've been a single mom for 10 years and online dating is a mess right now. You know, it's like all of these things that are are, and activism. If You know, I know so many women who want to get involved with activism. They just don't know where to start. And it's like a creativity, like there's so many different avenues that I hear women say like in passing, like, oh, I really always wanted to be a writer. I just don't have time for it. And I'm like, what? (laughs) (laughs) Oh, or start a YouTube channel. And like, I'm like, ah, like that's the stuff. What I do that makes my, the hair stand up on my legs. And I'm like, when are you going to do that? And how will I know? Like, that's what this program is about. Is about finding the time, having to say no to certain things so you can say yes to you. Mm, Yes. Oh, I love it. Oh, so good. Well, let's jump into the last two questions. And the first of those is, where have you seen resistance come up in your life and how have you overcome it? Oh my gosh. Well, the first thing that comes up, I think it's probably because it's the most present, is my own upper limit stuff. And for those people that don't know what that is, it's, it's when you, you know, Gay Hendricks wrote a book called The Big Leap, and he sort of coined the phrase upper limit. And his explanation is that we all have like a set point of happiness or success. And when you really personally, in my experience, jumping into being an author, which is still sometimes I'm like, who's an author? I'm like looking around, you know, (laughs) that's me. (laughs) Having now two books has really, I've been handed this invitation to, like I was just talking about, like step up and step forward. And with my first book, I had one, I'll just give you a quick example. I had one book event and it was in my hometown of San Diego because I knew a decent amount of people would show up and I knew I was going to know 98% of them personally. I was too afraid to have like a book tour, like nobody's going to come or what if actually people do come, that's even scarier. And this time around, I'm like, no, I'm going to do this. Like, these are the scary things for me. I'm going to do the scary things, even though my inner critic is like, whoa, abort mission. (laughs) That for me is where I feel resistance about shining, about really acknowledging my own accomplishments and things that I do really well. Mm, Yes. Ooh, yeah. I need to read that book. I still have not. It's a short read. I do recommend it. Yeah. Okay. (laughs) Awesome. I I will find it. (laughs) And then last and most joyfully, what are three ways you can think of to jumpstart joy in your life, in the world, or in other people's lives? I think creativity. I think that we don't spend enough time being creative. And 
I think creativity can look different for so many people. I'm a writer. It's what I do. But that does not mean that it's yours. You know, it might be painting or cooking or decorating or singing or quilting or knitting or there's so many different things that can be done. And people tend to say like, I don't have time for that. And you know what? Me too. I run a company. I write books. I have two children, one that has special needs. I have a husband. I'm the operations manager for my house. I'm on the PTA board. None of us have time. (laughs) You make time. You make a priority. You have to say no to certain things in order to do that. And I get so much joy from sitting down and writing for me that I'm not going to put on my blog or, you know, or on Instagram or anything like that, that it's just for me. So that's my answer. Mm, I love it. Ooh, thank you so much, Andrea, for being on. This has just been a real treat. <laughs> no, Paula, likewise. I, I love, I love your questions and I'm just so happy to get to meet you, even though it's virtually. <laughs> <laughs> likewise. Thank you so much for all of your great insights and wisdom, Andrea, and for being on the show today. Congratulations on your book launch. As I said, I read this book cover to cover and it is so good. It is, of course, called How to Stop Feeling Like Shit, and it hits the stores today, January 2nd, 2018. So be sure and go pick it up. Um, It's such a great read, and it is available on Amazon and bookstores everywhere. If you want to find the link for Andrea's site or other places to find the book, you can find them in the show notes for this episode at jumpstartyourjoy.com slash episode 115. And while you're there, be sure and sign up for my free course, which is Joy Plus You Unleashed. And it will support you in finding all sorts of joy in this new year. And you'll be the first to hear about my upcoming Facebook Live events. Next week on the podcast, I am excited to have Emily Ann Peterson joining me. She is a professional cellist, so she is a musician who developed an essential tremor in 2012, which meant that she could no longer play the instrument she loved so much. She has written a book, Bare Naked Bravery, where she shares about her journey of rediscovering her work as a pianist and a singer, and what bravery, creativity, and joy looks like even when your circumstances change drastically. Come back for that heartfelt conversation next week. And until then, I hope that your days are filled with so much joy.